Hi there, it's Toby with some quick housekeeping notes. Firstly, I wanted to report that this podcast is about to celebrate its first birthday. Uh, And this is a great opportunity then to say what I should really say more often, which is thank you, dear listeners, for listening to the show and for engaging and giving feedback and suggesting future guests and all the things that you've been doing enthusiastically for the past year. Um, Especially if you've been on board right from the start, uh, you've been riding the learning curve with me when it comes to audio quality and and production and so on. Um, So your patience over the months, especially with those early episodes, is really very much appreciated. Our audience continues to grow, despite the fact that we basically don't really advertise or do any kind of promotion beyond just publishing episodes on social media. Um, And I think that means we must be doing something right. I'm also honestly kind of proud of the incredibly broad range of guests and interviews in our back catalogue now. And there's more exciting stuff planned for the future. Um, And so with that in mind, I'd also like to ask you kindly, if you're listening to this and you can think of a colleague or friend or uh, opponent who's interested in the science policy interface um, and might enjoy a fortnightly dose of conversation about it, please Share the good news, point them in our direction. You can find this podcast or they can find this podcast on Apple, on Spotify, on Google Podcasts, on all the smaller podcasting services too, and on YouTube. And it's always completely free, thanks to the generosity of the European Union. So you can recommend it equally freely with a clear conscience. In fact, if you ask me, it's it's pretty much your bounden duty to do that. And then two other things to mention about this episode particularly. Firstly, it runs a little bit longer than most, which I admit is partly self-indulgent, since I find this one of the most interesting topics we've covered. But I'm confident you'll enjoy it too. And secondly, there's a couple of moments when our guests refer cryptically to something that they pronounce as YASA. Um, What they're actually referring to here is the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Austria, or IIASA, or IASA, I suppose. Um, So now you know. And with that in mind, enjoy the episode. Hello, welcome to the Science for Policy podcast. My name is Toby, and today I'm joined by Drs. Nicole Arbour and Piotr Magnuszewski. Nicole is a specialist in building scientific collaborations and networks, especially internationally, before taking on her current roles as External Relations Manager at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Austria. She held similar roles in her native Canada at both the National Research Council and the British High Commission. Her research background is in biochemistry, and she's also executive director of the Belmont Forum, which is a partnership of research consortiums and funding organisations focusing on climate change research. And Piotr is a mathematician and physicist who now works on interdisciplinary issues in complexity science, such as resilience, sustainable development, resource management and disaster risk management. He works at both the Centre for Systems Solutions in Poland and the same International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Austria. He designs working representations of complex systems to help scientists and businesses and governments and so on to explore those systems and their roles in them. He's also a professional game designer and he focuses especially on using games to communicate about science and policy, which is what we're going to talk about today. So, Piotr and Nicole, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Hello. I'm just going to come right out and say I'm really thoroughly looking forward to this conversation, which admittedly I do say a lot um, because I like this job. But there's something that I find particularly fascinating about the idea of using games to convey information, not just in science for policy, but I mean in science communication more generally. And I'm something of a games enthusiast in my spare time anyway. Um, So tell me a bit to start with about how you got involved in this area of work. So, I mean, let me take this one first. So I got started. I mean, I've always been very interested in uh, that science policy dialogue. How do you do the knowledge mobilization between the research community and the science policy community? And then coming to YASA, I was having a conversation about including or increasing interactivity in um, conferences, in panels. And someone said, you know who you need to talk to. You need to talk to Piotr. And then we sat down and we said, how could we build some really fun panels that really engage the audience and that really get people thinking about different ways of working together? And that is how our relationship and how I came to this particular conversation. 
That's very kind of you to say, Nicole. Um, thanks for bringing me in also in this beautiful way. So, so my uh, my story starts actually quite early. If I if I, I still remember this as a as a kid, you know, um, I was about maybe ten years old. I had some board games, and I immediately thought, well, how can I change them? You know, there's something missing here. So I would so I created my own version, and then it somehow was for me very natural later to think about it. But I haven't used it professionally for a long time, only occasionally designing some simple games from time to time. And then um, when I was uh, finishing my PhD, I met on the course um, Challenges of Sustainable Development, um, the game, uh, which has been designed by Dennis Meadows, Fishbank's game, which is the most recognized game about sustainability. And then, well, my instinct immediately jumped in and said, well, I can change it. I can make it a little bit different. There is something missing here. Of course, um, it might sound arrogant, but that was my thinking, and I started to do this. And um, and then step by step, um, as, we, as I've been working my professional life, I realized that people more and more want from me as a system scientist, not just the models, not just uh, all the complicated graphs and diagrams, but I want this experience. And that's how I got more and more into this. Great. So tell me a bit about the Fishbanks game. I haven't heard of that. So the Fishbanks game is a classic sustainability game, which is interesting in the game when you always lose or almost always lose. Um, you think that you're trying to manage the common pool resource, which in, in this case are fish. You have your fishing fleet and you decide how many new ships you want to build to get more fish. And you do this in competition with other players who do the same at the same time. So very quickly, even if you want to be sustainable, uh, you realize that you're staying behind, but also that might be some other factors uh, which uh, drive you to actually bring more ships to the um, to the area. And then eventually, what you don't realize is that you can catch many fish even if the population is going down. And you only notice the difference when it's really low, when it's often too late. So suddenly there is this moment about the sixth or seventh round, the game goes in rounds when you realize, oh, there is, there is no fish in the sea. Where have where are they gone? Uh, and, and you still don't believe. So, so the next round you, you send again all your ships and then very slowly you start to scan down when it's totally too late and when it's collapsed. So, so this game is designed in the way for the participants to, to lose, to have this experience. We have an issue, we have a problem. And if we're going to be serious about sustainability, we have to start act early. I see. And I guess this is built on the basic scientific understanding about how fish stocks respond to fishing and overfishing. Exactly. So, I mean, of course, it's simplified because if we were to represent all the real world complexities in this game, that, that would take too long. So it's simplified, but it's uh, b- based on the, on the very good science. But it's also not only the science of, of fishing or overfishing, it's also the, the system science which can connect different elements. For example, how better technology, which we have right now, can actually delay the signal, the feedback signal for us. Because people often think, well, if there are less fish, we can just always stop. What's the problem? You know, this is this belief, you know, that the system is kind of stable. And if we see the problem, we can solve it. But this shows from some of the systems perspective, are shown delays in the system. And often when we start, when we perceive the delay, the information feedback, uh, it might be too late you know, to reverse our actions. Um, so that's this aspect, which is based on research. It's both um, natural science and, and, and psychological research, uh, which is embedded in this game. And additionally, and that is what is beautiful in this, that it's like the computer model, which we have. So the part of the computer model is there in a computer, which you run as a part of this game. But the other part of the system are the participants. So you basically have a complex model of the complex system, which is partly in computer and partly represents by the participants. And what is strange and worrying at the same time that we almost always get the same results. Almost every group is overfishing the area and and, and having this trouble. But there's also the hope that they can actually learn from this and and this emotional experience which the game brings uh, can help them to to get awakened much faster than any lecture would. Right, thanks. So, So Piotr, you're the game designer, I understand. Nicole, what's your role in this endeavor? Um, so my role is uh, bringing the game to certain populations. So, for example, for this first, um, the first collaboration that I did with Piotr uh, was really based around uh, the Canadian Science Policy Conference. And so there I really wanted to do something innovative, something different, something that no one had seen before, but something that was also going to engage the audience in ways that the standard panel 
just doesn't anymore. We've all seen a panel. We've all seen the three panelists and the moderator. I wanted something where the audience was going to get an emotional reaction and not because they were arguing uh, with the panelists, but more because they were experiencing something. They were getting some experiential learning. And so when uh, my colleague said, you know, you know, Piotr is an expert in this. He will help you or he will probably be able to talk you through and brainstorm some ideas. And it started off very simple. It started off, what kind of interactive things can we do? So the discussion started off around facilitation. And then um, when Piotr started bringing in some of the examples of these other games that he's done in the past, it, it you know, the idea blossomed and it became significantly bigger in my head. And uh, I was just really pleased and really happy that he decided that he was willing to collaborate on this with me. And so in that context, we started off thinking we would do an in-person role-playing game within the Canadian Science Policy Conference. Uh, but then COVID hit and the world changed dramatically for all of us. And then we ended up having to, in a relatively short period of time, and I say we, but really Piotr and his team did all of the heavy lifting on this, change an in-person game to a virtual game. Hmm. Okay, great. So you've both mentioned some examples of, of the topics that these games cover. Before we get too deep into how they work, can you also give some examples of groups that you've worked with, either policymakers or otherwise? The groups that we were particularly, or that I was particularly keen on engaging with, were groups that uh, were associated in the Canadian Science Policy Conference. So that is you know, your, your group of usual suspects, which includes um, academics who are interested in studying uh, science policy. It includes researchers who are interested in engaging with the science policy interface, but may or may not have different levels of experience. So they may be coming to learn, but they may also you know, be seasoned professionals. You also have a lot of early career researchers who are trying to figure out what they want to do with the rest of their lives. Um, and then you will also have occasionally, um, you know, the policymakers themselves who sit at the cold face. And so really the idea with this was to, to do a lot of making people think about different perspectives. And so by, by having this simulation there, you can put people in uncomfortable or comfortable roles and you can watch then hopefully they will gain empathy for the other party. They will understand a little bit more what the interface looks like. And the idea is really to build bridges. Or at least that was my idea and the reason why I um, tried to bring this process into this particular discussion. And it really comes from also the International Network for Government Science Advice uh, has a whole pile of case studies that anybody can use. And so in before coming to the role at IASA, I have used these and I've used them with the Science and Policy Exchange, which is a student run group in Montreal to help people gain experience on uh, using a role playing type game in an in-person setting, much less elaborate perhaps than than what uh, Piotr um, has and will, des will describe. Uh, but you still get that context sh shift and that's what we're looking for. Yeah, that makes sense. So Piotr, tell me a few more details about the games that you design. In fact, maybe to straighten out the terminology here first, I'm calling them games, but I've seen you also call them simulations. Oh, the, the terminology is a tricky thing because uh, the first thing I should say that we ourselves, I um, mean, the team, you know, have been working with for, for quite some time, we became skeptical of the term game um, because for many people, it sounds almost like frivolous. Oh, the games are for entertainment. There can't be anything serious. So even adding the simulation in front of this didn't quite made it up. There is also another idea that the games has to be competitive, that you have to have a winner or loser, which we also challenged and many of the games, if I can use this, this term, are not designed to be. It's more like a social experience, more like interactive theater in which we, we have feedbacks, uh, we make the people, participants take decisions, uh, see the consequences, but we're not necessarily telling them, oh, you won or you lost. So that's why we also use often the term social simulations or policy simulations, depending on the area of, of, of applications. And actually, I prefer these terms uh, for this uh, for, for, for these reasons. Okay, great. So let's call them social simulations or policy simulations. Give me a high level description of what these simulations are about and how they actually work. So we've been definitely working on, on the core topics uh, of sustainability. So um, we have games uh, about climate change, about disaster risk management, about river basin management, and they are on very different levels. So there are some global ones. Um, the, our game, The World's Future, which uh, has been designed to participants to get a feeling of the synergies and trade-offs between different sustainable development goals. Uh, we have the games at the level of river basins. Uh, for example, our Nexus game has been applied in the Indus or Zambezi river basins with different um, actors ranging from African Development Bank to local communities who've been engaged. 
And yeah, and we have some games like, for example, our Pipes game, uh, which has been developed and everyone almost heard about the Flint disaster in the in the US when they have this water quality, uh, water polluted by lead. So there was another city, East Lansing in Michigan, which has the same story. And we have in, in cooperation with the researchers from, from Michigan State University, we have designed a game to deal with this issue. So that's just some, uh, some examples coming from the area of sustainability. But later we also um, started to look, um, so this science policy interactions uh, that we work together with Nicole, uh, this is about the political dimension, how can we think about future of the Arctic, what are the geopolitical forces, but of course linked with sustainability too. And finally, I should say that we've been also working with um, artists, uh, with dancers, for example, also here from International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, when we're trying to bring about the mind shift about thinking about sustainability and change to collaboration, or that we made a game about democracy uh, that we developed jointly with the Polish theater in the underground um, as a part of the theatrical social simulation, as we, as we called it. So the range is very, very broad and it's constantly um, expands, I would say. Mm. Amazing. So you say it's a broad range. Okay, but I, I noticed a particular theme of sustainability. Um, is that because sustainability as a subject is particularly suitable for gamifying or is it just your personal interest? I think it's my, mostly it's my personal interest, uh, which, and the values, which translate into my research interest and um, how I would like to be useful for the world. Um, what service can I bring? And so we had the situation sometimes that we have different uh, organizations or business approaching us and wanting us to develop the game in other areas. And of course, any type of business management is um, it's an excellent area that you can design the game. And there are many games in these areas, but somehow, yeah, I think, you know, even if we try somehow, I don't know, maybe universe was guiding me that the sustainability is my area where I would like to create. So <laughs> I stayed within this <laughs> area. Understood. And other subjects that don't work well, or let, let me ask instead, um, what is it about a particular topic that makes it better or, or more suitable for gamifying? This is also a very interesting um, question and, and there is a big discussion um, around this. So the, there's one thing that I have decided to work in the in the sustainability area, which is more like a content decision, narrowing down, which is still, of course, a huge area. But there's also the type of um, games or simulation development. So one other reason that I mentioned that we call them social simulations, um, it's linked with this... Um, way we design the game. So you mentioned the term game, gamify, gamification, and it has been very, very popular. Some people thought that, oh, this will just take over a very trendy and takes over many other trends in business. But when you look closer, there is a lot of criticism also that this gamification is uh, it's like manipulation. So basically, from the perspective of uh, business especially, you want people to behave in a certain way. So you create a cool thing, game, and then they, after playing, you hope that they will uh, well buy your product or they will be just doing the positive um, feedback and, and so on. All these things which are good for business. And of course, I mean, with sustainability, we have some kind of moral high ground, you know, that we say this is something which people really need to change and do. But our assumption is always that we, we see autonomy as a big value. We don't want to manipulate them into change. We don't want them just to start, I don't know, recycling or doing some other thing uh, which are beneficial, but we want to change their understanding. We want to challenge their understanding, leaving them their autonomy to make the reflection, to make this um, new mindset on their own. So, yeah, I mean, I think games are so broad. If you if you take all of the existing games that you can apply to almost anything, uh, but we limit ourselves, and this is some kind of ethical limitations, um, giving people freedom, not manipulating them into doing something, but rather creating this uh, reflection moment and deep reflection moment when they can change their mind, but they're fully in control. Right. So we can come back to some of the details of the games you've mentioned. But what you just said, I, I think, is very interesting, especially because... Um, well, so, so take, for example, the, the Fish Banks game, which I know you didn't make, but it's a good example. It seems like the game is designed to teach a specific lesson that the designer had in mind. So like at the start of the design process, you can imagine him thinking, OK, I want to show to people that this particular way of fishing leads to um, an unsustainable outcome. It's a tragedy of the commons, right? And that we don't 
we don't notice that until it's too late. And so I'll build a game where people are likely to fall into that trap and then experience the depletion of fish stocks and, and, and get the message. How is that different then from a company, for instance, creating a game to persuade people to behave in a particular way, to buy their product or whatever? I mean, obviously, other than the more altruistic content of the end goal, it's the same thing, surely? Yeah, it's a good challenge. So um, I would say eventually you're right that this uh, distinction is maybe not so clear cut as I was explaining before the moment, uh, but let me try. Um, so the one example which I'm going to say is not my own uh, leading, but it was my friends uh, who were running the simulation. And they, uh, of course, as usual, they led to overexploitation and collapse. And there was some very competitive business people. And well, you know, we knew that we're quite competitive. So the person who was running the simulation said, well, you know, she wanted to start the debriefing, some reflection on what happened. And she said, well, you are actually, I'm, if I, from my practice, you are the ones who fastest um, depleted it in a, in the shortest time. And the response was, yes, we are the best. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I think a lot of thing, many things in, in the simulation, in social simulations happens not during the game, but when the game is over, this is the debriefing. And um, so, and there are a few things here. First of all, this is eventually up to participants, what kind of conclusions they make. And we have to admit as uh, moderators, as facilitators, that there is a limit, you know, and we're not trying to push people and say, this is the right answer. Uh, this is also linked with the way how we usually lead the debriefing, that we ask questions, we help people reflect, we help them give them their reflections, we may give them the support, some literature, something which supports, but eventually, as I said, we're very much respecting their autonomy and even leading the discussion. We're not trying to silence any voices who I say, no, I don't believe it, you know. Uh, the reality is different than when you present it in a game. For me, this is a great result. If we get into this discussion, how the reality is working, if we get into this dialogue, that means that we don't take things for granted. And even if, if the participants end up with different worldview than I have, this is for me perfectly normal and even desirable. Uh, so it's a philosophy of the whole experience of the both simulation design and the debriefing. And last but not least, I would say that we are very, very open to treat the game not as a truth teller, the ultimate truth, but as a kind of box which we, people initially experience. And then we open this box and say, these are our assumptions. Okay, you disagree. What are your assumptions? Let's make a discussion. Quite often, this is the participants between themselves have these discussions and learn from each other. So it's not my job to go and make a lecture. Oh, climate change is so awful. All oh, tragedy of the commons. You should do everything to avoid it. I I'm not saying any of this. It's all participants who draw conclusions. And I have to say, in some games, they draw different conclusions. And well, that's how I leave them with this. <laughs> Yeah, that makes sense. I hadn't I hadn't thought about it that way. I was imagining people learning the lessons of the game, but I like the idea it might also prompt them to to challenge the model that the game's based on. Yeah, it is, and that's why also it's another aspect of our uh, of the game design that we have that we're not trying to represent reality in all full details. I mean, it's impossible in principle, but there are multiple games, uh, often single player, where you have very complex model, hydrological model, or any any landscape model, which which is so complex that you can't really open this so easily. I mean, you'd have to take a lot of time to to explain it to participants. We prefer much simpler representations, and this is the art of the game design to capture the essence without losing the important um, details. So it's uh, believable to the participants that it represents the processes which they experience in the real world or as they know it. And at the same time, we can open these assumptions and have this um, discussion later. All right. So the transparency of the process that the game is depicting is, is an advantage in itself. So like participants don't just experience the outcomes, they can also understand how the decisions led to those outcomes. And that strikes me as different from um, a computer simulation where there might be a very complex I mean, imagine an economic simulation, for instance, or a, a, a program that's bottling a weather system or something. You'll have like the surface level effects where the player interacts and can see the results. And then underneath that, you might have a, a huge and very intricate model, science-based model, which, which is processing and, and determining the results of the input. So the computer's doing a lot of work there and it can be opaque. But in the games you're describing, it can't work that way, partly because of the nature of the game itself and partly because... Well, like the topics are contested a bit and you want people to be able to examine the underlying assumptions. Am I on the right track? Yes. So uh, 
with the games which we use the board game kind type of representation, um, we made a specific effort to kind of keep the simplicity. And I already explained with one example of this uh, renewable energy intermittency, how people can actually see, kind of do this with their own hands. And there's the same with the Nexus game, with the World's Future game. We also have a computer a computerized version, uh, which, which uh, for example, for the World's Future game about the SDGs, uh, there's also online version, but we put a special effort there to not only to make a result, uh, to show this is a decision and then indicate the results, but also to kind of guide in this, what we call the result phase, that they see what actually happened. You know, so here we have a, a CO2 level was increased, just simplifying very simple example. And that's why we have this disaster. So we always emphasize this causal connections and we explain them. And we allow this time in the debriefing sessions to go deeper into this and add some additional explanation. We usually have some system diagrams, which are then presented during to the briefing session so that people can understand the bigger system and and that's actually actually woven into the discussion into the debriefing discussion that we slowly reveal all this um making the mechanism which 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 is behind the game so partly this is in the game design itself partly this is in the debriefing especially with the computer games we have to add more to the debriefing because there as much as we're trying to explain how it works there's always some uh some unknowns and um but yeah, for us, it's very important. This is one of the goals to understand the system. So we don't want people just to believe us. It's not like, hey, I'm a scientist. Why don't you trust me? It's more like, I, I know why. And also, if there are some people who are experts, they can challenge this. They can bring other evidence. And that's the, the further discussion, which I think is all good. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, with that particular way of proceeding it strikes me you're kind of approximating the same process as a traditional scientific process where one scientist describes a model and then others review it and, and criticize it or indeed the policy making process with proposals and debates and counter proposals but here you're allowing both sides to actually get inside the model and see like you said see viscerally the effects of the decisions Yes, and if I may use an example, sometimes this border between games and actual exploration of the um, policy pathways, you know, in the in the specific regions, may be blurred. So, for example, we we we've been doing this project uh, in the Indus um, River basin, and we had this. Uh, it was fantastic uh, work which was done by Yasa scientists, and they presented the models. And well, usually we have a few people in the audience. If they come, some other scientists, they are very quick to discuss. But when I look at the people who were coming from this more policy making um, or NGOs or business, they were looking at the graphs and, and yeah, not so much engaged in the discussion. So we made the the you can say the presentation of the model using this game element. So we had the river, we have the energy which is produced, the water which was flowing. All these things were kind of done manually by all the participants. So not only that everyone was so quickly engaged and everyone knew what is happening. So here is the Kabul River coming from Afghanistan and we have the people from Afghanistan who are deciding what they do on their part. Here is the inflow from India into the Pakistan and how much is getting there. And then people within Pakistan between the provinces who are discussing how they should make what kind of what best investments would be should they build another dam or should be more nature based solutions and in the end even you know this this blurring which i mentioned before a moment is is also revealing revealed in such a way that sometimes we are asking okay here is the representation the pro current agricultural production in this region and the person is immediately telling us no it's it's wrong this is what it should be so it's oh great so now we can improve our mod not only the game but we can also improve our model. So as a way of knowledge elicitation, it happened to be fantastic, which something which we didn't get through the presentation of the model. Mm. I think perhaps a bit too late, really, before we spend the whole episode talking in the abstract, we should maybe have a concrete conversation about what these games are actually like in practice. Um, so, I mean, maybe some listeners are familiar with more conventional games like board games or role-playing or video games. Are your simulations basically variants on those or is this something completely different yes so um uh that's uh well i'm, I'm just wondering which which game to to start even from but uh, you're right you pointed out that um there are different types of games there are board games there are computer games role-playing games uh, negotiation games and all of them uh we actually have designed you know in this almost like 15 year um time that we've been developing them so 
Um, so yeah, if we, for example, if we take the the game, the Nexus game, which I mentioned earlier, um, there's an issue of the water, food, energy, or water, energy, land uh, Nexus, which is recognized by scientists as the very important area of the interconnections between uh, between these three areas. So. Um, uh, I mean, it's a lot of presentations. You can read an article, um, you can watch the movie and so on. But um, we're trying to give them this uh, first-hand experience of what it specifically means. So we created a representation, which is a, a board, um, uh, which we created a map of the two countries which share the river, which is going this cross transboundary river. And in each country, you have agriculture, you have energy, uh, you can build a dam. Um, you have also uh, domestic water use, which, which you have to supply. And you have some uh, wetlands, which are very important for biodiversity itself, but it's also some income coming from tourism. So each country has their own configuration to start with, but there are these dependencies upstream and downstream. There are ministries within each country. So there is energy, there is um, a water, and there is agriculture. And they have to negotiate between themselves. And then suddenly all these theoretical connections, they come up because you want to uh, invest in a, in, a, in a big dam. And this is good from one perspective, but this is uh, the, your colleague even from a ministry may disagree. And very much the other participants who play the roles of the different go government of the downstream country may also disagree on the decision. And then you also observe how your decisions affect the environment which you are in so that's um that's one type of experience with this type of uh, board games oh yeah and okay but it, so it sounds like the the kind of basic experience of players is not like rolling dice and moving around the track say it's more having conversations interacting negotiating that kind of thing I, I should have mentioned also maybe earlier that this uh, this is one thing characterizing our social simulations and why we call them that there are plenty of people who well, this is all before pandemic started. Uh, we have the board game. We had an experience in one room. And then all of them uh, were discussing all the time, changing. They're not sitting even at the same table. So unlike the board game, we create a rich representation in the whole room or not even a number of rooms. They have different roles. They can either make a, create a meeting when they can all together uh, meet and discuss, or they have all kinds of bilateral meetings and negotiations trying to achieve the goals from the perspective of their organizations, which they represent in role play. So it's combining the board games, combining the role play, and making this all in a very spatial configurations. And we had some game like this with up to even more than 100 participants at the same time. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> So I imagine if I if I join one of these simulations, I'm told who I am and I get a little briefing at the start saying, you represent such and such a person or organization. Here's your interest in the scenario. Here's what you should try to achieve. Yes, we had this consideration at, at the beginning. How should we assign the roles to different participants? And um, for yeah, different situations, sometimes we give people the roles which they are very close uh, in the real world, so they can better, uh, if we want to really learn and, and expand on this and then translate it easier to the to the real world, uh, quite often a situation, quite often they just basically build on their experience and if they are working for the government, they can have a government role, if they work for business, they have a business role. Um, and and that's that's interesting because they bring all this experience and and through this role play and the negotiations they they know very well how to do this, so it's create a rich experience that everyone is learning from. But at the same time, uh, we can be sometimes also switch. So if we see that the empathy, the the understanding of the other perspective, if there is strong conflict, we sometimes switch the roles. So if you work in the government, maybe you actually be representing a farmers association in the in the simulation, or like changing between business and NGOs. So so sometimes we deliberately switch the roles to encourage empathy, and maybe maybe we have a little bit more. Uh, accurate representation of what might happen, but we have this also other kinds of very interesting, interesting learning. And then uh, when when participants start, uh, we give them some materials so they can get into the role. So as you said, if you starting as a, for whichever configuration, but you starting as a government official, you may get a letter from your predecessor or this position saying, "Well, you know, you are now a new minister of the environment, and this is very important for you to pay attention to this, this, and that." And so in this way you get some briefing, some direction, which of course you can change. This, all decisions are your own. We don't tell people what to do in the given roles, but we try to create some framing um, to recreate some of this, um, besides the mechanics, some of the other social, political aspects of the situations. 
So the people who are taking part in the simulation are having negotiations and making agreements and so on. How is the outcome of their actions fed back to them? I mean, do you as the moderator pause the game and say, okay, you all decided to do X and Y, and so the new situation is this? Uh, so it's different. I mean, we always prepare some structure and whether this is, uh, again, the board game or the computer game or this narrative game, there is always certain structure. We know exactly what to do. But within this structure, we are we are always open. Like if participants come and say, oh, this is something which we would like to do. This is our idea. We remain open for their interventions. So uh, sometimes we are yeah we are surprised with, with the ideas which they come. They just use the game structure and they try to do completely new thing, you know. So I'm and thinking and usually saying, well, yeah, well, we can probably implement it and 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 add it. Um, but especially in the online games, we have to have the ready structure of the stories, news which is coming. Because, yeah, I mean, it get, online engagement is harder than than the face to face engagement. So we experience this, and well, we still we're still thinking. Actually, this is one of the active development areas: how to get people even more kind of engaged. So they stop writing the emails on the side, which they always do on the Zoom conferences, but they fully engage in a game. And we're coming up with the well more interesting stories. We're coming up with just nudging them with different messages coming from what we use for this are uh, called non-player characters. And maybe Nicole, you can tell more about it as you were doing this role in such a way that, uh, that the participants, even if this initially complex thing and uh, they don't know what to do, they immediately get someone saying, hey, why don't we do this together or the other thing? So maybe Nicole, you could provide some example from your experience. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I think the, the storyline has moved forward through a series of, of decisions that people have to take. So they're given questions to answer or votes to do based on, you know, the, the storyline. So, for example, with the, the Arctic Treaty, you're asked what, what kind of environmental considerations should be taken into account. And you're given a series of um, multiple choice questions. And then you have to answer those multiple choice questions. And based on how those questions are answered, you go to a different future, if you will. So a little bit like if I don't know in, in your childhood, if you had choose your own adventure books, but they were some of my first reading. Um, and then you have those, as, as Piotr spoke, uh, the non-player characters. So I've had the pleasure of being a non-player character. And we're the, the, the characters that go in and, and stir the pot. So you see someone isn't engaging enough. Well, you go in and you poke at them. You you maybe you'll you'll try and uh, engage them in a conversation by telling them that your per perspective is exactly the contrary to theirs, and trying to convince them to come to the dark side. Uh, come to the dark side because I can do all of these things for you. Oh, if you vote in my direction, maybe I can provide your organization, your country, your company, your whatever character that character is doing. I will give you these benefits to my friendship. Um, you. You can also, as a, a non-player character, start an incendiary conversation. You can be like, oh, this is all, you know, completely, uh, I, I think we need to, you know, do something. And then you know that people are going to jump in. And so basically you're trying to nudge movement when there is no movement. Um, and and it's, it's fun. So sometimes uh, participants are trying to be too good, you know, I mean, in the situation, in the real world, you have all kinds of, uh, of course, lobbying and incentives, which often creates all these problems. But I noticed that in this uh, conference, especially sustainability crowd, they immediately trying, oh, yeah, yes, agree, everything for indigenous people, everything for the environment, business is not important, which normally would, would, wouldn't happen this way. So that uh, this uh, NPCs, the non-player characters, they also kind of bringing this realism into, into the situation. And this is again uh, all mixed with the stories, uh, which we add, you know, bit by bit, you know, as the as the simulation um, develops. Uh, so it might be a good moment that we also listen to some examples of the elements of the stories, uh, which normally are presented as videos. But I think you'll be able to appreciate also what kind of stories uh, come in. So sure, okay. So let me say for the benefit of listeners, um, by the magic of technology. I'm going to play now uh, the audio from a video that's part of these game materials. And I'll put the link to the original video in the show notes so you can go watch it if you want to. Look at that mess out on my fields. There's water everywhere. I can't get my equipment out there and I figure it's, it's probably a total loss. I am not sure what happens now. I just know that I can't go back. My family counts on me. I hope I can bring them to safety. Our members are nearly going bankrupt because of the supply chain disruptions and the trouble of our Asian suppliers. They had it coming, I'm telling you. How much would you be willing to bet on something as risky as those mines? 5% of your investment portfolio? 
maybe 10? Then get this, they don't even know themselves how many of their investments are at risk of climate change. Because do you think they bothered with climate risk assessments? Give me a break. So all it took was just a little push. The fund has shares in a mine. The mine stops working because of fires. The fund goes bust. And then there's the bank that had shares in the fund and the insurer. It's like a goddamn domino is what it is. Tick tock, tick tock. Before you know it, bam, game's over. The blockages and disruptions in the Suez Canal only show us how vulnerable we are in terms of supply chain for minerals. Minerals we need for batteries and the whole Green Deal to succeed. Now there's news about other crises. In Chile, in Australia, in Russia. I'm afraid it may end up in a supply chain disaster. The answer is to become more resilient. So that's why we invite governments, businesses and NGOs to co-create new policies that will prepare us better for future crises, like the one we have now. Ah, cool. So the people we just heard are actors, I guess, right? They are, well, let's call them actors, although they, not all of them are professional actors. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we use our friends, colleagues. I mean, Nicole has this role there too. Um, and she did an excellent job. So, um, yeah, when we, we, we don't want to tell the just one person who's reading the story. I mean, making this in interactive, in the also visual form, it's what gives people the chill, you know, that they say, oh, this is really happening. Now we have a problem. And it's all, all kind of important elements to make this um, immersion into, into this experience for participants. One thing that springs to mind, you've mentioned so many different topics that you work on, even just within sustainability, which clearly isn't everything anyway. Is this really just one like template game design where you could slot in different content depending on what you're asked to do? Or are you designing everything bespoke each time? It's both. So we have already some by now, some typical schemes, which we can change, reuse, and especially this uh, latest developments in this, uh, which example you, you, you heard, we talk about this Arctic future simulation as uh, is an example when we can reuse it for many different topics, just replacing the content, which is the plenty of work because you really have to research the content. You have to create all these videos. You have to create all the decisions and so on. But still there is an underlying software, which help us now to, to manage this, which, which just shortening the recording time. But our usually attempt is to usually start and see if we have a new project, if we have potentially sometimes new client, see what would be the best, you know, simulation for this specific situations. We always ask what are the needs, what is the purpose of this from, from our partner side? And we think, well, that would be the best. So we're not trying to kind of fit it um, into the existing scheme, but rather if it naturally fits, that's okay. If not, then we create something, something new. And at the end of taking part, what do you intend for participants to have learned? Yeah, I mean, so the, 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 what you're hoping that they learn or what you're hoping that you get out of it is um, that people get perspectives in different contexts. So, you know, whether that's a social context or societal context. So the idea is really to that people gain a little bit of empathy for the people around them, um, and, and also what kinds of evidence are considered by policymakers, right? Because evidence is, in a, in, a, in a research perspective, evidence looks very specific, um, right? It, it looks like data. It looks like what you're studying. But in a policymaker's perspective, evidence is different. It's also, you know, what this is going to do to my economy. How are the people going to feel about this? All of these different pieces. So it's, it's really that we will be able to see that. And in fact, when you talk to the uh, participants, you also get some of this out of uh, out of them um, to the point where we've had conversations. Now, I've, I've, I've had outreach from Canadian government officials who really enjoyed the science policy simulation that we did at the Canadian Science Policy Conference and are now thinking about how do we how do we use this to teach our um, internal scientists to speak to our internal policymakers. So, so, you know, we're currently having these discussions, like, how do you use this tool to bring to bridge these these conversations together? Um, so that's not only what we hope, but that's what we have some anecdotal evidence that it actually does.
Well, yeah, we have a lot of anecdotal evidence, which I'm actually quite keen on because the stories from the participants are, are, are sometimes fantastic. Um, sometimes you just, it's not even a story you just observe. So we started this conversation with the fish banks game and the version that we developed on modifying this original, uh, we used at the Economic University in, in Wrocław in Poland. And we had uh, some professors who were specializing in kind of investment strategies. So they quite quickly, they, they started to develop the investment strategy, how many ships, you know, in what time, what would be the return of investments and everything. And there was this collapse. Uh, and I was actually expecting that they would challenge this and say, oh, no, 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 this is the game is strong. You know, we have our calculations right. But I've seen the genuine kind of pause and reflection say, oh, that's something which is not in our investment model. Uh, we might need to actually start thinking. So they naturally were coming to the point which now science get that, you know, we need to talk about social ecological systems, not just separately economics, not separately environment. Uh, and that, that that's for me the, the huge reward when we observe it. Another example, like how people get it is from coming from our energy transition game. Um, when many people have this um, understanding or some kind of understanding, what is the problem with the renewable energy? There is this intermittency problem, but what does really means? And then in a game, uh, when they get the representation of the system and they suddenly see, oh, there is now, the, we, we created some different representation to simplify this, that is like kind of long night, like a polar night. And during this, we cannot use our solar panels. And then there is a time of the uh, simulations when the wind um, uh, mills are not, not working. And then see this, how energy demand is not satisfied. And they see, oh, maybe we need a storage or maybe we need the demand side management. So all these important concepts are represented as, as it says, um, procedurally. So it's not only that you have a visual representation, but you can actually do and have a feedback. And this is called a procedural representation, which we have in these games. And we have so many people gave us the feedback that now I finally understand what it means because I had a feeling, but this is now visceral. You know, I, I know what, what people are talking about with, the, with, with these things. Perfect. And let's drop in here the second of our little audio clips. And these are, I believe, short interviews with people who've taken part in the games. So these are real people now, not actors. Yes, my name is Takona Jamini. I am from the kingdom of uh, Eswatini. I am currently a student, a master's student at, with the University of Zimbabwe, uh, doing a course in integrated water resources management, finishing this year. Um, yes. Okay, fortunately for me, uh, I started attending the workshop uh, yesterday as part of the group of students. We were trained on scenario development. We were given a platform whereby we practice or, 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 or we get to play a board game in decision making in terms of how we handle water as different departmental water users uh, and interlinking systems in a water, water system or what can I say? Yeah, just uh, water users within the water system. Uh, so what we did there was to, I for one was playing a prime ministerial role, whereby I was governing how the different ministries and departments work according to their demands to use water and how it affects the system in its own. And of course, the major part being how to handle a budget as a prime minister in that. So what what what, what I've learned, what we learned today was the importance. Of course, I, I shouldn't forget, we worked as a downstream country operating a river system with an upstream country, even though there wasn't interaction much during that process. But that, of course, was discovered as a gap into managing a river channel or the river system as to we tend not to work uh, in close correlation with upstream, upstream countries or other repairing countries into the river and that impacts our decision making and also the quality of water and the amount of water we get to use as different users of water within the downstream and majorly in itself as ministries we saw that not working in an in integrated manner, if I may put it that way, working in silos did impact the resultant uh, outcome of the natural resources we get to govern uh, using the water system in itself. So, yeah, it was quite an eye opener. And of course, the presentations that got to give us an insight as to how does then this affect the future possibilities of the sustainable use of the resource. Uh, yeah. 
basically <laughs> that's what he did. <laughs> no, it was an interesting simulation because um, I mean, in, in our project, in our uh, landscape, we are um, working on a development that we hope will increase tourism, and it was just an interesting uh, drill to test to see how fast you kind of lose control. You kind of think you can just uh, take out the problem for every round, and it's just one or two sites extra that just makes the whole system collapse if you don't actually start to create permanent solutions for it. So it was just uh, interesting for what we're trying to do. Um, that was really nice uh, game because you get to see that actually you cannot do anything by yourself. I mean, you need to to work together, people need to work together with governments, with, uh, with all the authorities and everything in order to achieve really good things. And it's not a, a solo kind of work. <laughs> all right, so you've clearly collected some very good feedback from people. Do you ever encounter the opposite? Do you encounter resistance from people who are perhaps not so used to taking these things seriously or who think they don't have time in their day to quote-unquote, play a game? Yes, so uh, that's why I explained also we sometimes don't even use the word game, one of the reasons, there are others, and there is often um, this, this this kind of resistance, especially before we actually... <laughs> so so it's sometimes difficult to get people to start playing. Once they start playing, yeah, I mean, there's always some people who are not super happy. So just let me start from one high-level example. We had a very famous um, economist who was participating in, in, in our simulation, uh, there was a simulation which we actually also wanted to represent the interaction between science and policy. So, so we have created, based also on some very uh, relevant research by James March, we have created a situation where everything is, is quite chaotic. It's not like that, as often scientists assume, you can have the cost-benefit analysis, you can analyze the problem, see the solutions, see which solutions are the best, but this is very much like a constant stream of problems coming to you. There is constant stream of solutions, different group asking and pushing you, take this solution, take that. And then you have different decision opportunities. And finally, you can even be moved from one decision place. I mean, you have a role, but then you move to another department and suddenly you are in the middle of a different stream. So we recreated the situation based on the case of the Bengaluru or former Bangalore uh, in India city, which is a super complex case case uh, of environmental problems, uh, rapid economic developments, water shortage, and so on. So this economist, he quickly left the simulation and later he criticized it very strongly saying, no, this is not how the world should work. I mean, we have the, need our best scientists, we need the best minds and they provide the solutions. We, we have to avoid this chaos at all costs. And I think that he didn't quite get it that it's maybe a noble idea, which some people might disagree, that we need more stakeholder engagement, not only the best scientists, because there is different types of knowledge, but also that it would be very hard to change reality and we have to learn how to do improvements in this chaotic reality. So that was one kind of resistance, which maybe is different than what you ask for about with respect to our games series. But I wanted to mention this because that was for me a very interesting experience and story uh, as, a, as a game designer to, to receive that sort of feedback, which I, of course, it was, uh, it was hurting a little bit that someone criticized, but at the same time I thought, well, it means that actually our intention was kind of um, working, that it was this uh, chaos which Many other participants said, well, this was so revealing and, uh, and, and, and they actually, well, I wouldn't say enjoyed it, but they, uh, they were happy to, to have this kind of experience. Okay. So now you clearly have a lot of expertise, obviously, in designing these simulations and in the systems thinking that's required to do that. But nobody could be an expert in all the topics you cover. And what I would be terrified of, and what I thought you were going to say when you mentioned this economist, was having someone in the room who just stands up halfway through and says, no, you've misunderstood the science. This isn't how things work at all. Like this game is broken. How do you avoid that kind of issue? I mean, do you just bring in a consultant expert for every simulation you develop? Yes, that's basically it. I would say that we always develop this game in partnership. It's not like that we're sitting here, what kind of game we would like to do. It's, uh, it's always some project or some client or partner coming at us and we usually say, well, you, and usually these people bring their, their expertise. The reality is often always that, uh, well, they don't, 
if we, for example, work with other partners in, 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 in some project that they don't always have time um, to help us on every step, but we always have this kind of prototype testing when we invite the experts before reaching the, um, the, the wider audience. So we always open for the criticism and opening. And I think, yeah, we have quite a few times a situation, not something which would totally say, oh, this game is totally wrong. Uh, well, except this one, <laughs> uh, which I just explained uh, for different reasons, but I don't think it was the, the representation. Um, but but sometimes people actually coming at us and saying, you know, I don't think this worked like this. And we always, we are very humble and open and say, well, thank you. Thank you. This is a very good contribution for us making the next iteration of the game. And people are usually sympathetic and even happy that they could actually help and contribute. All right. Great. So I'd like to talk a bit about specifically applying these games or simulations to policy making. So at the science policy interface, and a lot of people listening to this podcast are quite familiar with this interface and how it normally works. So for instance, um, in science advice, where most of my day job happens, you basically get a bunch of scientists together in a room, you ask them a question, they review the evidence, then they, they tell you the answer. And then policymakers can take that into account or not when they make decisions. Um, this is obviously a very, very different uh, paradigm that we're talking about here. So what do policy simulations have to offer that more traditional methods don't? And I know we've talked a bit about viscerality and being inside the model, as it were, but I guess I'm asking now, so what? Does that lead to better policy making somehow? What do we gain? Well, I think it's perspective, right? So often, I mean, we can always be critical of the people with whom we work, um, but really understanding the perspective that everybody is coming from and recognizing not all evidence is created equal, but also your evidence is not the only evidence, right? And so I think that that's how I see these really adding to that dialogue where, you know, you can have that group of scientists sitting in a room and they can contribute. Uh, they can contribute based on the state of the art. They can look at all of the historic knowledge. You can do lovely reviews. But normally when the government comes to them, they don't have time to do that. They're asked to bring this material together in a very short time period. And, and I don't know about you, but certainly I have heard criticism in the past that this is just not you know, we need more time. Like, how can they possibly ask us to do this in such short a time period? Um, and the reality is that time does not always exist in these spaces where you have to make decisions in a rapid fire kind of way. But it's also nice to be able to put people in a position where they also see the other kinds of evidence that are being applied to a situation, right? So it's not only scientific evidence, which is a very important piece, but it's also social related, societal related evidence. It's it's about, you know, the guy whose job is going to be lost because of the decision that you make. It's it's about the, um, you know, the economic well-being of a population. It's about, uh, it's, it's, it's about beliefs of a population. There's so many different pieces that come into these discussions that as science advisors, you don't always think about because it's outside of your bubble, right? So it's, it brings all of the different, you know, sort of bubbles together. Not It doesn't really force you because obviously you have the choice to leave, but it, it gives you an opportunity to view what's inside someone else's bubble or the different bubbles that we're all engaging with every day without even realizing that we're part of. Uh, and so I think that that's, that's how it adds value to the science policy interface as, as you described it and as, as I also experience it rather often. Yeah, that's really cool. So I can definitely see the impact on the scientists who are giving advice, as you say, to like appreciate these different perspectives, um, to understand the person they're talking to has these other concerns to worry about too, as well as the evidence. Is it also a value to the policymakers in the same way? Can you use these games to train policymakers too? Uh, well, I mean, I would say yes. So policymakers often don't understand science. And, and I don't mean that, and it sounds very, um, that, sound, that didn't sound very polite. Um, but what I more mean is that they don't necessarily understand the amount of work that is necessary to gain the kind of evidence that is needed, right? So either either that is bringing together all of the evidence that happened in the past. So where do I gather it? What is relevant? What isn't relevant? Which studies are representative? Uh, what are the boundaries that I'm putting around this study? So if you think about like, for example, a Cochrane collaboration or, or something like that, where you're really doing a review of what is state of the art, that these are huge endeavors that take a long time. But, but policymakers don't necessarily have a window into that reality. Um, also, uh, uncertainty. So scientists are trained to understand uncertainty to a certain degree, but policymakers have a harder time with the kind of the, the way that uncertainty is presented in scientific terms. And so also having a view into that window is also interesting, right? So 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 really looking at what what does the scientific process look like a, a little bit more? Um, how does this work? What are the different time scales? Um, what are the uh, 
the ways of presenting information that are more clear to me or less clear? And what are the things that I understand or don't? And how can I use this as a place to pull some of that apart? That's interesting. And that's all uh, on top of the understanding of the basic science, the state of the science, which you can also get from reading a paper or review. Yeah, yeah, there's, there is much more to have than just the, the basic state of the art, for sure. And if I could add, add a little bit more to this, because um, this is such a rich area, and Nicole, you already covered a lot of this, but there is still uh, some more um, to add. So um, or let me just use an illustration, which I've heard also from Dennis Meadows, who I mentioned already today. Um, and he said there's two basic modes. Of course, there are many shades of gray in between. Uh, of scientists interacting with policymakers is one, you, you do your research, you write a report, you just go, well, it's hard to get them. So you kind of getting and visually like putting the report under the door, you know, uh, so hoping that the policymakers will read and, and, and make use of this in the decision making. And that that's one mode kind of um, idealizing this. And that another mode is what he called invisible college. So you actually manage to bring um, several policymakers in different configurations, in different times, uh, in the same place and having an interactions, having them discussion. And, and I think simulations are an excellent way of doing this. So they, uh, they not only learning from each other, ideally also it's not just policymaker, but both scientists and policymakers, but it's also the thing that simulation bring here, which this gaming, this playful aspect may be a benefit. So if we have all these people in the room and they, they, of course, they have the very strong positions, which they have to keep because I mean, they're representing all kinds of organizations, their interests and so on. So let's, let's play a game, you know, let's, let's play. That allows them to be more open. And when they allow themselves to be more open, all these other perspectives that Nicole was mentioning are kind of easier to, to reach. There is a psychological mechanism described as kind of a defense system when if you try to persuade anyone directly, it doesn't work. We have all kinds of walls. But if it's in a game, if it's like a role, you can try different things that's, that, that's lower this. And this, this wall, which this, this barrier which we have against the kind of alternative different opinions. And let's add to this, this is a, a philosophical approach called constructivism with such names like uh, Dewey, Montessori, Piaget, Maturana, uh, who've been claiming for a long time and with a lot of evidence uh, coming from research that we don't learn just by listening. We learn by constructing things actively. So if we have a presentation that's probably most passive. We can still think and try to interact with this. If we have a discussion, that's the next step. But even more, if we have this uh, simulation experience, when we take decisions, when we see the consequences, when we negotiate different things, that's the possibility to construct the knowledge in the, in the new way. And that goes both ways. So we believe it's not just that scientists should, or the policymakers should learn from scientists, the best science, but it's also a lot of things which scientists have to learn from policymakers, how to frame their research, how to see the world, because quite often the research questions are not put um, in the way that, that would be then useful. So, so this is a, a full um, mutual, uh, with the mutual respect interaction, which we need to bring. And again, simulations are the great uh, ways to actually make it happen, opening up. And I can add one final thing to this, because what you said just raised raised it with me. And that is the thing that we're not really thinking about in this context, but and, and I don't think about very much as much because I've been living in this space in a virtual world. But when you put these humans together in a room, they also build friendships, right? So what all that Piotr just mentioned is an ice breaking activity. You're breaking the ice between all of these humans. Some of these humans are policymakers. Some of these humans are scientists. They're now going to get together. They're going to negotiate. They're going to do all these fun things. They're going to, you know, as you mentioned, it, it it, it's sometimes a bit silly, sometimes a bit different. It's outside your comfort zone. And then you've built relationships. And then they may go out afterwards and share, uh, you know, have discussions over uh, a meal or any, any other thing. And then you've got a friendship. And now you have friends that are scientists and policymakers who can then reach out. So you can actually have concrete outcomes that are creating linkages in this community. I think in a virtual space, this is harder, but I think in a real space. So when we're doing uh, these kinds of activities in an in-person environment, it's a lot easier to build those human to human contacts that then can have long term impact in the policymaking space that we don't always consider because we're thinking about the immediate now. We're thinking about the game. We're thinking about all of the pieces around the game. But those relationships are hugely important. 
Absolutely. And let me add a real world story coming again from one of our simulations that we ran. So you can even turn enemies into maybe not friends, but get the enemies talk to each other. So we had a simulation which was linked with the actual real world decision, um, which has been made about or is about to be made about the ski lift in the national park in the mountainous area in, um, in Karkonosze Mountains in Poland. And there's been the people who just didn't want to come. They said, oh, if the other person comes, I'm not coming. You know, I don't talk to him. You know, and bo on both sides. Well, we managed somehow to lower this and uh, and they, they came together, they participated. Um, it was different type of simulation. I, don't, I won't go for detail here, but in the end, what we've been observing that these two guys were sitting together and drinking wine and talking. And I don't know what they talk about, but they, they were looking very friendly to each other. And just before this happened, they, 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 it was really a lot of work to bring them together to this room among many people, not just to talk to each other. So we see this, um, these things changing and building these relationships exactly. It's some Think which, uh, which is another aspect, uh, which I, I believe you know, lectures or discussions don't build that well. That makes sense. Do you have any examples you can point to uh, of like concrete outcomes you've achieved, especially perhaps with respect to influencing policy or not influencing, but maybe but helping policymakers? Well, I mean, one concrete outcome that that well, concrete. I mean, I guess it depends on how you define concrete. But my fa <laughs> my my current favorite concrete outcome is that I'm actively involved in discussions between um, a govern a Canadian government department and a Canadian academic institution on developing a research project to test how these work in situ, how these uh, social simulations work. Where in this particular government department there is both policymakers and researchers, but they don't necessarily engage with one another. And so what they're doing now is they're working with, uh, with academic researchers on the ground to develop the whole process. And the idea is that if there's enough value to this, that it could be applied more broadly to government, right? So if you can see in department one, that you do the social simulations, you increase the engagement between the two groups of individuals, you build these bridges, and many of these problems are transdisciplinary. And so it makes a lot of sense to actually break down the silos and do this. And so I mean, it's the beginning of a concrete example, right? Because what we will see is over a long period of time, is this going to work or not? I don't know. But for me, it's fascinating to watch. It's fascinating to see these groups getting together. It's fascinating to, to be part of, to be a fly on the wall. Well, I guess I'm a little bit more than a fly because I'm actually engaging with. Then to think about what does a proper successful outcome look like? How do we measure that? Uh, how can we say, this worked well. And then when we say this worked well, how do we apply it elsewhere and share the love so that, you know, this science to policy interface becomes a little bit more porous? No, I mean, it's a, it's a general problem. Thanks, Nicole. It's excellent. Um, uh, the, the general problem here is that what we work on is the, about uh, minds and change. Uh, so if you're going to the change in the real world, this is a kind of second order from the game because game by definition is the uh, some representation of reality. So by achieving any fantastic outcomes within the games, we're not changing the reality, <laughs> we're changing the minds of the participants who then need to go and use this understanding and insight in the real world. And that's uh, measuring this uh, further change is quite complicated methodologically, but also practically. So unfortunately, we are mostly limited to measuring the change through the evaluations that I mentioned, what people self-report, which is of course limited. But let me mention one um, specific examples when we have been doing quite elaborated um, pre and post uh, evaluation to the simulations and in itself the simulation is interesting because because we've been approached by um, a cleric um, who came to us and wanted to use games for the better understanding and promotion of the Laudato Si encyclical by, by Pope Francis. So I say, well, why not? Let's, uh, we, we develop a game and we train uh, religion teachers. Uh, sometimes they were nuns, sometimes um, uh, secular uh, religion teachers. Um, and then they were going and running this with kids. And we did the assessment also, what they know, because that was very much about climate change as the encyclical. And we measured the attitudes and the knowledge about climate change before and after. And we can see the quite um, statistically significant difference which this game achieved, which was also amazing to see this, which we didn't quite measure, but how our uh, adult participants, the teachers, you know, how they were enthusiastic about it and how happy. And, and they had all these kind of metaphors. They say, you know, this game is wonderful, but I see it's not only about environment, it's also how to become a saint, you know? So <laughs> that was very much for them for like personal transformation and change, um, this kind of tragedy of the commons that, that was part of this. 
Yeah. I like how Nicole was challenging me to say what I meant by concrete. Um, and Piotr, your example was helping people on the road to sainthood, which I think <laughs> is about the least a concrete example I can think of. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't make it up, you know, there were several participants who... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I believe you. But I mean, yeah, it must, seriously, it must be so hard to be able to put your finger on uh, concrete results when you're just running a simulation for a group and they assemble as a one-off and then they all just go off into the world and, and do what they do. Well, just think, if you have a government department, then you have inside, you, you, you almost have a captive audience, right? Because they're all employees of the same organization. So in theory, it would be easier to get them all back a year later or a year after that or a year after that. This is why this idea of, of being able to do it within a government space where there is a little bit more control than when you have a random assorted group, you can say a year later, um, you can follow up with the same people if they're in the same jobs or otherwise, and you can continue to to follow. So I, this is why I'm so excited by this, this idea within a, a government department. Yeah, well... Listen, we've gone way over time and I have no sense of perspective anymore on, on where I imagined this conversation would go when we started. Um, but I hope listeners can take at least something interesting away from it. And thank you, Nicole Arbor and Piotr Magnuszewski, um, for all the really interesting ideas and perspectives and also for reminding me that no matter how much I might enjoy my job, there's always someone else whose job is way more fun than mine. Uh, I'm sure your job is super fun and it's been lots of fun to talk to you. And I look forward to other opportunities to explore fun science policy topics, either through listening to the podcast or contributing in some way. Yeah, I'm jealous. I mean, if my second choice would be to, if I weren't a game designer, I could do the, the work which you're doing. <laughs> well, <laughs> Thank you we'll very have much. to arrange a job swap one of these days. Yeah, uh, you're welcome to join, you know, any of the design process that we will have. And uh, thank you very much for inviting us. It's been a great pleasure. The Science for Policy podcast is produced by SAPEA. We're a consortium of Europe's academies and learned societies, and we're part of the European Commission's scientific advice mechanism. We provide evidence and expertise to inform the work of the group of chief scientific advisors. SAPEA is funded by the EU's Horizon 2020 program for research and innovation, and you can find lots more information about us and our work at sapea.info. Finally, the rather lovely cello music that's playing right now is performed by Elizaveta Sushchenko, so I shall shut up and let you enjoy the last few bars. Bye for now. <laughs>